Hey, it's Chuck. Am I the only one that loves the oatmeal at these hotels in the morning? Apparently. I mean, a spoonful, yeah, I of, so. brown, <laughs> a spoonful of brown sugar, a, a ladle full of raisins, and that hot, hot, hot oatmeal, man. I love starting my day that way when I'm on the road. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball. Now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start. <laughs> and welcome in. That was my uh, appearance with the, the best damn podcast in the land. My buddies, Dan and Chad. And we went for, geez, probably an hour and a half. All Buckeye stuff. Uh, the episode probably is about an hour that they posted. And I'm going to link that in the description. So you can check it out. We hit on all sorts of Buckeye stuff, much more than just breakfast. And uh, we are going to talk about a few of the topics that we went over a little later on. But I wanted to start with Ryan Montgomery, quarterback out of Finley, and he has signed with Georgia, which means that the two preeminent programs in the country, Ohio State and Georgia, in the class of 2025, both have a quarterback from the state of Ohio, with Tavian St. Clair, of course, being the Buckeyes quarterback. I think that's awesome. And I hope it's something that we're going to see more of in the future as we bring on spring football and these guys start to develop at a faster pace. There's also a lot of high school offenses that are evolving around the state. So it's it's a really good sign of things to come. And uh, I'm, I'm listen, this was a ballsy move. So last year they brought in at Georgia, Ryan Polisi. Uh, he is so good and impressing so much down there that they really didn't even care much about losing Dylan Rayola. So that's who's in front of Montgomery. And behind him coming in is Jared Curtis. Jared Curtis is, you know, the quarterback uh, from Tennessee that we were in on big before Corey Dennis left. We were kind of his number one choice at the time, and we lost out on him. Now, he's one of these next level quarterback prospects, number one overall in the class of 2026, not just the number one quarterback. He's kind of like in every other or every three to five cycles, you see one like him. Dude's got all the tools. Uh, massive arm, really, really big and just strong can for an arm. Like he, he might be a really great one. And he signed 10 days ago. So Montgomery knew that. And he's going in there anyway. Stones, man. Stones. Kablisi in front of him. That dude coming behind him. Um, credit to him. I'm really happy for him and congratulations to him. I think it's awesome. Also of note. He is in the all-white Georgia uniform. I swear, dude, these kids never wear the actual uniform in their pictures when they go get those photo shoots. They always wear the alternates. Just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Day two of the transfer portal was today, and I was on offensive line watch again. Not a single guy, not a single guy that could have came in and been an impact player at Ohio State maybe eight spots down. There's not one. And I've been saying it for a little while. If we're looking at previous portals as any, indica any indication, we're not going to see very many offensive linemen. They're, they're going to fit the bill to be a plug and play guy for Ohio State. They're just not, they're rare. They're just very rare. You know, they're usually in a good spot. They're usually obviously starting and they're, you know, obviously going to get taken care of if they want to leave. Uh, because they are so rare. So it's going to be difficult to uh, find what we're looking for here uh, unless they actually go out and, you know, really start knocking on doors and trying to find that guy and get him to come in. And that could very well be happening through back channels. We don't know. But as of now, there is not a single guy that I would I mean, look, maybe Enoch, but not Bamahi, but anybody else, there's nobody I would trade anybody on our roster for that's in that portal. It's just, there's not anybody in there enticing one bit to me. Um, so the portal, you know, day two, and we were promised uh, this was going to be a really impactful one. Now, there's still spring games to come. Additionally, this week, there are a lot of teams that are meeting with their players and kind of giving them the rundown, their evaluation, where they stand with the program, how they fit in moving forward. And once those spring games this weekend come up, come and go, and those meetings are done with the players, we will see a whole lot more players enter the portal. But the players that are 
waiting for those meetings and those, you know, spring games to see what happens in the spring game, how much they play, the kind of footage they put on film. Those are second tier players. Those aren't starters. Those aren't big names. You know, those guys don't care about the evaluations. They already know where they stand. They're studs. And they don't, <clears throat> they don't care what happens in the spring game. They don't care. They're studs. So those type players, none of them are going to be affected by any of this stuff that's going on this week or at those spring games. So, you know, I don't know. It seems to me like this is a lot more mild than, uh, than the last one, to be quite honest. Now, there's still, you know, 12 days left of this, 13 days left of this. So we'll see. But, you know, if it's uh, any indication how it's going to go based on how we started, I just, uh, like I said before it started, I don't think it's going to be anything that we're going to look, we're going to look back at the end and be like, okay, yeah, I mean, that wasn't so bad. And if that's the case, ooh, buddy. <laughs> ooh, buddy. Um, Greg Doyle. Listen, guys, Greg Doyle, man, this guy. I can't stand Greg Doyle. If you're not familiar with Greg Doyle, he is a super douche sports reporter out of Indianapolis, works for the Indy Star, and he likes to write controversial nonsense. He likes to fight with fans on Twitter. He's also like super tough, right? And he reminds us by his Twitter bio where he has a picture he's taken of him training MMA in the gym a sports reporter, and he has that on his Twitter bio picture, him in the ring with some gloves. But uh, I, the reason I hate this guy primarily is because he tried to make a big name for himself by taking this uh, stance that Ohio State should fire Urban Meyer. And he thought that Ohio State should fire Urban Meyer specifically for this. And uh, obviously had to make a change on our coaching staff yesterday. Um, it was the best interest of our team. I'll answer maybe a couple questions about that, but once again, my focus is on our team and our players as we move forward. So, honored to be here, and I'll answer any questions for you. Raise your hand. We'll get the microphones right over to you. We'll start down here in the far left corner in the front. Uh, Bill Landis from Cleveland.com. Urban, you said earlier that you were aware of the incident with Zach in 2009. Your inquiry into 2015 was unfounded. You couldn't find anything. Why fire Zach now if you had kept him on staff after 2009? Well, I am going to address the 2009 because I've been asked about that. 2009, Zach was an intern, a, a very young couple. As I do any time that I imagine most coaches or people in leadership positions, you receive a phone call. First thing you do is tell your boss, uh, let the experts do their jobs. Uh, we're certainly not going to investigate. It came back to me that what was reported wasn't actually what happened. And so... Uh, Shelly and I actually both got involved because our relationship with that family and um, advised for counseling and wanted to help as we move forward. 2015, I got a text late last night that something happened in 2015 and uh, there was nothing uh, unless, once again, there's nothing. You know, once again, I don't know who creates a story like that. Now, Urban Meyer lied to reporters about whether he knew about Zach Smith's domestic violence allegation in 2015. Urban did know about that, and he said right there in the clip you saw uh, at Big Ten Media Days in 2018 to the reporter pool that he didn't know about it. It was a very foolish move. If you're going to go up there and you're going to answer questions, you better be ready to be truthful, because if you're not, this is what happens. But the press isn't the court of law, and they're not an investigative arm <clears throat> that a coach is required to be truthful to. Um, specifically speaking about this incident right there and saying that's terms for dismissal is a real stretch to me. But Doyle and Brett McMurphy and a couple other enterprising reporters really tried extremely hard to build a big name for themselves off of that entire situation with Urban and Zach Smith. It was very transparent at the time what they were trying to do, and it clearly worked for Doyle as he's still at the Indy Star. So obviously, uh, He's just a talentless hack, and he says some really creepy shit on Twitter. And uh, this tough guy stepped in today. <laughs> this tough guy, he really stepped in it today. I mean, this was <clears throat> epic middle aged guy like creeper stuff. So, Caitlin Clark, the M the you know superstar from Iowa, gets drafted by whatever WNBA team plays for Indianapolis. I have no idea what the name of the team is, but I know who Caitlin Clark is, and she's the only. High school or college girl I can name since Katie Smith, to be quite honest. Um, I had a crush on Katie Smith when I was young. Katie Smith, of course, Ohio State woman's hooper. 
Uh, she was awesome and she was cute. But anyway, Caitlin Clark, I'm allowed to say she was cute because I was a teenager. Now, this guy, he's a middle aged dude talking to Caitlin Clark at her introductory press conference. Okay, now let me set this up here. So, what she's doing, he, he makes this sign to her. We can't see it because it's off camera, but I guess she does this, this heart shape to her family. Now, he's asking her about that heart shape, and I'm going to play this for you now. Hi, Caitlin. Uh, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Real quick, oh, let me do this. You like, you like that? I like that you're here. I like yeah, that you're here. I do that at my family after every game, so. Okay, well, let's cool. start doing it to me, and we'll be able to get along just fine. So, question is... Okay, well, let's cool. start doing it to me and we'll be able to get along just fine. Seems to me Gregor's got himself a little crush there, buddy. But uh, Dylan Davis, is I first saw him retweet that, our buddy Dylan Davis, um, for the Delaware Gazette. And I showed it to my wife because I found it quite creepy. And my wife was mortified for the poor little girl. But uh, obviously just extremely creepy. And I'm sitting here like, okay, I'm going to talk about this in the show tonight because this is the this is the jerk that came after Urban for, listen, you can come after Urban for a lot of stuff, right? You can come after him, maybe the way that whole situation unfolded, but specifically to come after him, this was before everything came out. Just, just for that lie to the media, that's what really irked me about when that went down and why I you know, have always had this vendetta against Greg Doyle. Um, but this right here, dude, I'm like, man, there is no way this is gonna fly. This dude is going to have to come out and make some stupid apology. Um, and it's going to be sappy and horrible. And he's going to hate it. And I couldn't wait. And it didn't take long, guys. <laughs> Did not take long. So he apologized. It came out. Here it goes. And it included lines like, I'm devastated to realize I was part of the problem. I'm sort of known locally, sigh, for having awkward conversations with people. What I've learned is I need to be more aware of how I talk to people, not just athletes. My heart dropped because now I saw it. In my haste to be clever and welcoming, I offended Caitlin and her family. Here's the weirdest part about his apology. He never addresses the creepy part, which is him saying, start doing it to me and it'll be okay. He, he never says anything about that. That's the creepy part. But since he released this apology, some of his past sexually insensitive tweets have popped up. Um, I'm not going to read them, but uh, they're disgusting. They include things like bestiality and uh, just nasty stuff, man. The dude is a, is a full-on creeper. I didn't know about those tweets, but uh, they're flying around the web. And Greg Doyle, I think, has killed his career uh, after unsuccessfully trying to kill Urban Myers over a lie that he told in 2015 to Greggy and his buddies in the press. So goes around, comes around, pal. Look, when you're trying to present yourself as a tough guy, which he is, you can see his Twitter bio, and you have to come out and say what he had to say in this apology, uh, it brings me great joy, great joy. He had to basically explain his series of denial about what he said, fighting back, saying there was nothing wrong with his family, and then the acceptance that he was wrong. It was utterly hilarious. Let's talk about the new longer football season. The new longer season that everybody's preparing for all across the country. Coaches are changing the way they're operating. They're talking about playing more depth. They're talking about trying to add more scholarships so they can deal with this longer season. It's all garbage, all of it. The entire narrative is false, totally false. It took you 15 games to win a national championship in the old system. 12 regular season games, one conference championship, and two playoff games. That's 15 games. In the new system, there are three potential paths to win a national championship. One, you are an at-large team with no conference championship. Two, you are a conference champion loser that gets an at-large bid. Or three, you're a conference champion auto bid. Now, if you're that conference champion auto bid to win a national championship, it takes you 12 regular season games, one conference championship, and three playoff games. That's 16 games. Previously, 15. If you don't make it to your conference championship game, that's 12 regular season games, but you didn't play a conference championship game, it takes you four to win, to win the championship, so that's 16 games or one extra game. 
The only way you can play 17 is if you make it to the conference championship and lose. That's 17 games. However, the rule change to the clock last year took away eight plays a game. Eight times 15 games is 120 less plays on the season or one entire game worth of plays. Which means if Ohio State wins the Big Ten in the national championship, they will play roughly the same exact amount of football on the season as every national championship team in the entire playoff format, aside from Michigan last year, because Michigan last year played with the benefit of the one full game less of plays. Any team that doesn't win their conference championship will play the same amount of football as Michigan played last year. The only team playing a max of one more game of football plays are those conference championship losers. Now let's keep in mind, in the last system, the previous system, any team that is any good, right? They go into the season expecting they're gonna make the conference championship and they're gonna play in a bowl game. So they're already bracing for 14 games. They've always been planning for 14 games. 12 regular season, one conference championship and a bowl game. Every team that's good enough to think they were gonna make the playoffs were always planning for 15 games in the old system, which essentially means they were already planning for 15 games if they were a national championship contender. Now they're planning for 16 or a very off chance 17. However, a whole game's worth less, a whole game's worth of plays less. This is a big nothing burger, to be quite honest. It's an absolute nothing burger. And let's also keep in mind that next year, every single team in college football has two idle weeks. Every single team. So one game more potentially in a whole nother week to get right. It's a wash to me. It's really not any extra football. Now, the two idle weeks are not a rule change in college football. The calendar is kind of dictating how this goes. So the calendar, every year, the, the football season starts at Labor Day weekend, and it ends the final weekend in November. Well, in 2024 and in 2025, there are 14 Saturdays in that period when it's usually 13. So not a rule change that everybody's getting two idle weeks, but everybody has two idle weeks in 2024 and 2025. It'll go back to 13, 13 Saturdays in that period in 26, and it'll remain that way for a while. So that's just the way the calendar goes. Not a change, nothing to do with, you know, added games. It's just the way it's going to be. But every team has two buys for the next two years. So a very small amount of extra football and two idle weeks. The math doesn't lie. So, okay, so if we have established that the amount of extra football is, I believe, negligible, you may not, but you, we've established that it's just one more game, right? So if we've established that it's just one more game, and to me, negligible, maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't. So if we've established that the amount of extra football is either one more game or essentially negligible, which that's my opinion. You may or may not subscribe to the, the number of plays taken off, that entire game of plays being taken off as a full game. And if you don't subscribe to that, I understand. I do. Um, it, it is the number of plays that, that dictates, you know, draft stock and things like that with running backs. It's the number of plays, not games. Like that's how we judge the damage on a body. That's the metric that they use. It's the number of plays. That's how much football you play. That, that's football, the plays, not the game. How many plays you're in, how many contacts you have. That's how you judge that. So when you lose an entire game's worth of plays, to me, you've shaved a game off the season. So, But whether you agree with that theory or line of thinking, we can all agree that one extra game is not all this extra football, which is the way it's been sold by the media, all the coaches, and not just at Ohio State, everywhere, in hard. We've heard Jim Knowles, we've heard Chip Kelly, we've heard Brian Day, Ryan Day gone on, oh, go on about it for uh, and probably every single press conference that he's had since signing day. He's talked about it. The extra games, the extra games, the extra football, the need for the depth, the need to play the depth. Why? Certainly they've done this math, right? Certainly I'm not the only one who sat down and said, wait a second. Why are you all acting like this is so much extra football when it's not even 10% more football? 
Certainly they've done it. So why have they been selling it? Well, it just dawned on me the other day. Hello. I just watched spring ball and watched press conferences from all the two deep on the team, right? In every single one of these guys, when they talk to two deep players, they talk to them about what your role is going to be with the team this year. And they were all very confident that they were going to play a lot more because of all the extra football. So if I bring you in and you are on the two deep and I tell you what I probably told you last year, I promise next year we're going to play you more. You may or you may not believe me. But if I tell you I don't have a choice, I need to play you more and you believe that, you're going to stay. You're not going to enter the transfer portal. You're not even going to mess around with that. You know you're playing next year because the team needs you. There's all this extra football. And they all repeated in those press conferences about all this extra football that's going to be played and that they know they will have a role. Now, if that's the strategy uh, and it's being used to retain those guys, I'm all for it. My hope is that it is something that catapults them into more depth, playing more depth. Like I, I want to see those guys play. They have the quality pieces there to play, and they've been very poor when it comes to playing those guys, playing younger guys, playing the depth pieces. They've been poor with it. So I hope that this catapults them into that kind of you know line of thinking. Um, but if it does, it's not going to be because there is a whole lot of extra football, because there's not. Anyway, that's my tinfoil hat conspiracy on that one. I don't have many of those conspiracy theories, but this, this didn't add up to me. This did not add up. There is not a whole bunch of extra football, and they have certainly been selling it like there is for a long time and selling it hard. I thought like I would come away with a really, really good feeling and feeling very clear about where I would, where things landed. And, um, it it bothered me like as a fan the way that they rolled the quarterbacks because I feel like I didn't get to see everything I wanted to see. We got to see one series with Devin Brown with the ones and two series with Will Howard with the ones. And I guess the big question is why? Why didn't we see more? And I've seen it floated that, well, maybe because it was really windy and they didn't want them to both come out and look like trash because it was so windy. Now, I didn't realize when I was watching the game how windy it was. But when I saw Tim May on the field after the game and just listened to him sit there with his microphone talking, it was very clear how windy it was then. I was like, oh, geez, yeah, it is pretty bad. And it was. You could barely hear him through the wind of the microphone. Papers were flying all over behind him. So it was pretty rough. But the second reason is maybe they already know who they want and they know who the starter is. And they don't want the other guy to come in there and look awesome in their choice to suck, right? So let's say in this case, I believe that they already know they want Devin Brown to start. I'm sorry. I believe that they already know they want Will Howard to start. And if Devin Brown comes in and lights it up and Will looks bad, then, you know, that starts a whole big thing again. The thing with Devin Brown is we've had so many, like, it just feels like it's been this this nonstop controversy involving Devin Brown. And I think he's going to lose this battle again because I don't really think it was ever really a real battle. I think it was always Will Howard, and I think that it is going to be Will Howard. Is that a good thing or not? We had some talks about this on the podcast. And what decision would you make if you were in that situation? If you put, put it like when you said you have to pick somebody and it has to be today, I'm riding with Devin Brown because of I, I I've seen enough of his. He has the strongest arm on the team, um, which is helpful, but he, his deep ball. And if you even go back to last year, like uh, the way that he can just drop it in. Dan is a big Devin Brown fan. He's been calling for Devin Brown the whole time. Obviously he called for him all year last year, which, you know, many of us did myself included. Uh, when he was healthy, I didn't like the way they did it at the beginning of the season. I don't think anybody did. They said it was going to be both of them playing, and Devin got a little itty-bitty smidge, and Kyle got a whole bunch. But Dan has been a, a Devin Brown supporter all through last year, and this year he came into this year even after the Will Howard signing, and you know he, he wants Devin Brown. You, you've, been, you've been locked in on Brown for the, for the whole time. No I, I have. I mean, I have. I'm also, I feel like I'm fairly realistic. Like I understand what the knock is against him, right? 
he got he got dinged up last year. Um, Danny, he threw yeah. a, he threw a ball in the dirt, you know, at Purdue, you know, on a curl route. He, um, you know, got a little antsy, and the, the word you like to use, Chuck, is frantic. I mean, I think that was more a product of, you know, he was a first time guy in a in a game last year. And he was in a situation that he really wasn't supposed to be comfortable with. But to your point, Chad, he arguably had, he, he had arguably the nicest touchdown throw of the year last year to Carnell Tate, mm -hmm. you know, dropping that into the basket. And what was that like 30, 40 yards? Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I get it. He's, he get, he got dinged up last year. It, it's not part of his history. So, um, you know, hopefully that was a fluke. They did mention on the broadcast, Jenny Taft said that, you know, Devin said he was just happy to be healthy. You know, and, and that was a weight off of his shoulders going into this year. The goal is I want to win a national championship right now. I've got everything else set up to do it. I've gone all in. And my rear end is on the line here. Now, Devin Brown is a wild card. I believe he has a very high upside. And he's not going to reach that high upside until he takes some lumps, becomes the starter takes his lumps, gets his feel. We've never seen him get to start a little three block of games and get totally settled in and see what he can do in that scenario. We've never seen it. Second option over here, we've got a known quantity in Will Howard who can be both really good and not so good. He's a great runner. He's good with short stuff. He's a good leader. He is a very inaccurate downfield passer. There's no way around it. And that's not improving in someone's senior year. There's nothing getting better there. He is who he is with that. And the biggest question I'm asking myself is, can this guy deliver what I need to win the national championship in a championship game or a playoff game or a game up north or, you know, any big game when it comes down to the wire? And we're down late, or we need a game-winning drive. Can he deliver that? Um, but to your point, and Jock, I've heard you mention this, like if we ever have to come from behind or throw the ball downfield to win the game, I mean, Howard does not have the – I mean, he doesn't have the track record for that. And, and it's been validated in camp. Everybody talks about him struggling with the deep ball. That worries me, man. That really does. Those require, you know, the quarterback to throw the ball. Can he win in that situation? It's scary. I don't know. It's a tough situation. It's a situation that I've thought about a hundred times, and I'm I'm so on the fence with this. What would I do? Who would I start in this situation? I don't know, man. Um, Devin, a much higher upside to me. Uh, you know, I, the, the things I and I just can't forget what I've seen out of Devin in his high school tape. I can't yep. forget it. The dude is, the dude has that in him. And, you know, I'm not just talking, obviously, yes, competition's much easier in high school, but I've seen him make throws. I've seen the, the field dimensions didn't change from high school to college. And I would just love to be able to see him get the opportunity to settle in an offense for once, not be looking over his shoulder, be the guy and, and see what he's really got. And I think that upside is incredibly high. So part of me wants that, right? And then part of me is like, I think Will Howard is exactly, like, I think we know exactly who he is. And is that good enough to win a national championship? That's what I'm teetering on here. So that's why, for me, this decision is so tough. I, I'm, I'm riding with Devin Brown. There it is. Call my shot. But either way, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. And I think... This podcast was a heck of a lot of fun. You guys should check it out. So that'll be it for me tonight, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Chuck on Bucks out. Um, you know, we have a special guest today, Dan. Do you mind if Chuck goes first on his uh, any no. other thoughts? Absolutely. All right. Chuck. Yeah, I got I got another thought. I got another thought. So yeah, and, and it's and it's what you just said. Um there ha has honestly been a very long period in Ohio State history where they have not swung the big stick uh they have more or less operated like they are a upper echelon team instead of a top two or three program in the country uh and 
it's always bothered me. Like you said, when talking about Carlos Laco, like, yes, you're Ohio State. You don't need to settle for anything. And I don't think any outsider who really understands uh, college football would think that you ever would for anything. And that goes with recruiting, uh, especially. You should be in on every best player at every best position uh, in the country every year. You're Ohio State. Know who you are and act accordingly. And I just want to say that for a long time, they've not operated like that. And now they are. And they are in almost every area. And that's why we're seeing things finally look like, wow, this program is set up for success at the highest level every year in a way that it's not been before. The depth at every position, because they've changed the attitude within the program and understood who they are and acted accordingly. And I, I am so thrilled by this. And I know it's an arrogant philosophy, but it's just the truth. You know, the, the, we, we all know what Ohio State, State is in the history of college football and what it is currently now. Nobody could possibly argue that it's not a top three program in the history of college football and currently now. And, and they've acted like, you know, they're a top 12-ish program in the past. And, and that's always bothered me. Now, things are different. And that's why, to me, this is the most exciting time that I can ever remember being an Ohio State football fan. I think that we are on the precipice of kicking in the door and staying there for, for a good while. I, I agree with you, man. Like, I just, I kind of want to give me like, amen, man, bring it. Let's <laughs> preach it. All right, Dan, what do you got? Well, you know, on that note, it seems like they bought into the anti-bully campaigns, you know, that are in the middle school and elementary school levels of our society. And they they finally realized, Ryan, you know, and I, I think a little bit of it has to do with Gene going out and Bjork coming in. He's he's He said, I'm going to be a bully. You know, he got rid of his buddy Fleming, obviously one year too late. Um, the extension will never be excusable, but it is what it is at this point. He just gave his other buddy a $200,000 pay cut. Mm -hmm. A lot of people haven't talked about that. When those salaries came out the other day, Justin Fry's salary went from a million to, you know, 800,000. You know, my brother will said, well, he's probably got a chance to make it up real easily in incentives. I said, I don't care. The perception is, is that Ryan's holding him accountable. Right. Yep. And that, that I love that. I love that. Um, you know, one little nugget that I took away from the weekend, I had an opportunity, uh, you know, when I had breakfast Saturday morning at the hotel, which, Am I the only one that loves the oatmeal at these hotels in the morning? Apparently. I mean, a spoonful yeah, of so. brown <laughs> a spoonful of brown sugar, a, a ladle full of raisins, and that hot, hot, hot oatmeal, man. I love starting my day that way when I'm on the road. Um, but anyways, um, I was sitting there, and I, I was overhearing a conversation, and it turned out to be the mother of um, a recruit from Virginia, Joshua Pittman. And he's a rising junior uh, linebacker. And I was just listening to her talk, and, and I finally interjected, um, which I'm sure is shocking. But, um, you know, I started asking her, you know, what did they like about their visit so far? And these are the things. I've got them noted here. She talked about the facilities. She talked about the trainer, the recovery room, real-life Wednesdays, opportunity for after football, and, and what Columbus has to offer. Um she was really impressed that they had a plan for, for athletes at all levels, not just those going to the NFL. And then she was really impressed that they, you know, they asked the athletes and had them go one by one in the room. Like, what do you want to give back? You know, she didn't mention anything about the shoes. She didn't mention anything about the championships. She didn't mention anything about nil. Those were the things that she mentioned. And she happened to be an assistant principal. That was her career. Um, so, you know, you know, you, you, you could connect the dots there that those kind of things are important, but I was really impressed with that, that that's what she came away being impressed with. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, Mark and Mick are doing a really good job talking to these guys when they're in there. And it's no surprise that we're getting the level of athletes that we are now. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, I'm glad that you like things hot and fresh out the kitchen, Dan. Um, you know, I, Real Life Wednesdays is something that I've paid attention to for a long time, and I think it's a really great thing that they do. And I'm glad that they noticed and brought that up because that's something that there are for a lot of these kids. There is life after football. 
football, you know, and I always joke that like, if you played football for Ohio state and you did anything of any consequence that you can be a business person in Columbus and, and thrive for a very, very long time and um, never have to really worry about anything. Um, and, you know, there's a reason that so many people try to get close to Ohio state football and, you know, that's one of them. Um, and Jack, something you said about, and you guys both talked about being bullies. And so this is something that I had proposed to Dan a while back and uh, I'm not the only one that said this now. Some other people on other pods have said it, but they said it after me, so I'm going to bring it back up. Um, I still think it's Georgia, <laughs> Ohio State, and everybody else when it comes to where we are in fo- be- after Saban retired. It's Georgia, Ohio State for the brand. And then getting, you know, I, I mean, we can't go get 25 five stars. It's not going to happen. But I still think that you can kind of set your expectations higher now. And I really want to thank you, Nick Saban, for retiring so much. I mean, from the bottom of my heart to the top of my head to the block O, thanks for retiring, man, because you've made my life a whole lot easier. And it's a, it's a lot more fun to report on some of this stuff now that you're not there. So thanks, Nick. Appreciate you. Um, and, but, yeah, I, I – I, yeah, I th- I think it really is. It's Georgia, Ohio State, and everybody else right now, and everybody else is playing catch up. And and if you're and I wanted to I wanted to say something to those Michigan fans, and I mean this sincerely. I'm sorry about your um, recruiting restrictions that came out after the Cheeseburger Gate today, because you're already having a hard enough time getting recruits, and then Snoopy. Sp- Party is re- now reporting that Michigan football stadium, quote unquote, the big house plans to be a completely kill free stadium by switching to plant based meat. All ice cream, cheese and condiments will be dairy free as well. Michigan will be the first college football team to have a completely vegan stadium. So that lines up <laughs> with today's news. I have it. I have real? it. I, I have. I don't know. I have a screenshot of it. I'm not like just making it up. <laughs> it's on the chit-chat. Internet. It must be true. That can't be true. I don't know, man. Well, like, <laughs> I, I mean, either that or it's a hell of a troll job because it's funny. Um, but yeah, so that's my that's my little two cents for today. The name, um, the name of that account's not Snoopy's Camel Toe, is it? What? What? what where'd that come it's from? It's Snoopy Sparty. It's a Spartan fan, but I just I <laughs> Snoopy's Camel Toe. I don't. I think Snoopy's a boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've really derailed. We derailed. I'm going to lose our here. rating on YouTube, Dan. Uh, yeah. Um, so, Chuck, um, I appreciate you coming on the show. I kind of want to.